Go ahead and turn to John chapter number 7 this morning. John chapter number 7. We have emerged from John chapter 6, and here we are uh, making some new headway. I've entitled this morning, Just Tension is Building, because it really encapsulates what's happening here in this text. That if you know about the book of John, by the time you get to chapter 11 of John, you're at the week before Jesus' crucifixion. So John spends a massive amount of time uh, there leading up to the crucifixion and the, and the Passion Week. So there's a lot there. And he moves through the ministry of Jesus very quickly. For example, uh, last time that we were together in John was John 6. And that was surrounding the Passover. That was, you know, Jesus fed 5,000. Jesus walked on water. Uh, Jesus taught these people all of his hard sayings that they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And what does that mean? And he walks through this. That was Passover. Now you go to chapter 7. It's going to tell us it's Feast of Tabernacles. So there's a six-month gap in between those two chapters. And John does that regularly, that he'll just zip right over quite a few months of ministry and cover the high points. And he eventually gets very quickly to the Passion Week. So here we are about six months before Jesus is crucified. The tensions are continuing to build with the religious leaders. And the text is going to show us that over and over and over again. We'll see that so many times over the next few months as we work through John's gospel. So here we go of chapter 7. Let's read the first couple of verses and then uh, we'll read the rest of it as we work through the sermon today. We're ultimately going to get through verse 24, but let's just read the first two. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So that's telling you right there, tensions are rising. Uh, the religious leaders are against Jesus. They're wanting to plot his murder. And, and there's, uh, Jesus knows this, and he's in Galilee. And then it says this, now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Giving us a little bit of the timeline here. That what's the Feast of Tabernacles? Feast of Tabernacles is, uh, is a festival. It's a week long. It's a holiday that, uh, that the Jewish people haven't had. And it celebrates and remembers the Exodus narrative that they came out of Egypt and they were led through the wilderness for 40 years before into the, into the promised land. And while they did that, they were in tabernacles or they were in booths or they were in tents is what we would call them. But as they wandered in those tents, God miraculously provided for them over and over and over again. And it's meant to cause them to reflect back and to give God thanksgiving and, and great joy for how he had provided and had continued to provide. So here's what they would do for one week they would tent, they would camp. They would leave their homes and they would dwell once again in the tabernacles or in the tents to remember and reflect on what God did for them. So if personally, if I was a first century Jewish guy, this would have been my least favorite holiday. Uh, we just did a men and boys camp out this weekend and we camped, uh, my, myself and my oldest son, we slept in a tent. We enjoyed all of it except the sleeping in the tent part. I'm not going to lie, sleeping in a tent is not that fun. Camping, I like. Sleeping in a tent, I don't like. I, I go to work, literally, I go to work first and foremost for the glory of God. Secondly, to try to help people and shepherd them. But thirdly, to make some money so there can be a roof over my head and I don't have to sleep outside on the ground. And I found myself this weekend, I'm sleeping outside on the ground. This is dumb. Uh, so here's these people that had to do it for a week, right? This is a, a week long festival and celebration. And this is going to set the stage for some conversations that Jesus is going to have that I think will be particularly illuminating and helpful through the first 24 verses of John 7. So we'll look at uh, verse number three. We'll keep reading here in John chapter number seven. And we're going to come up with, through these first couple of verses, in this conversation with Jesus and his brothers, that uh, Jesus is against the world, yet for the world. Let's read it. Verse 3. His brethren therefore said unto him, so these are not, you know, just people, his associates. This is legitimately talking about uh, those that are his half-brothers. Uh, Jesus was born of Mary, a virgin, uh, but Mary's a spouse to Joseph, Mary Joseph. Uh, if, you, if you come from a, a Catholic background, there's a teaching that, you know, Mary remained a virgin for the entirety of her life, uh, which is something that you'll frankly never find in Scripture. And you would find kind of the opposite, that Jesus had other brothers. And the logical conclusion is that Mary and Joseph consummated their marriage and she had other children. And it's, it's amazing that these brothers don't believe on Jesus, but after his resurrection and ascension, they do believe on Jesus. And they actually come to, to faith in Christ. Jude writes a book of the Bible. But you find that there's going to be kind of a conversation here with his brethren that unfolds. And here's what happens. They said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. 
For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So what's happening here is his brothers step up and say, Jesus, there's, there's definitely something unique about you. There's some, something amazing. I mean, you have a lot of notoriety and people are coming to you and you're, you're doing miracles. We can't deny that. So why don't you go down to the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem? Why don't you get there? That's where the photo op is. That's where if, if you're running for an office, if you want notoriety, that's the place to be. Don't be up here in Galilee in the backwoods with us Go to the people, like play this well. And it says they don't believe in him. They haven't put their faith in him. But, but they're kind of pushing him towards what would have been the, the logical step for a natural politician or someone who, who wanted to be hoisted up onto a pedestal is to go get this notoriety and go there. And Jesus answers and, and says to them in verse 6, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Look, guys, I got an appointment with death. I'm following the will of the Father. It's not time for me to do that. You can do whatever you want when you want, but it's not time for me to go. Verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. We'll get back to that in a minute. That's a hinged verse. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So he says, look, You go ahead, you go to the feast, you do your thing. I'm staying here, it's not yet my time. But he says in verse number seven, but the world cannot, does not hate you, but it hates me and it hates me because I speak the truth and I tell the world where it's misstepped and what the evil is. And you find two things here. Jesus is against the world for the world. So Jesus is willing to say, hey, you're wrong. Hey, that's, that's evil. Hey, you can't do that and be against or in opposition to what the, the normal thinking would have been for the world, but for them, right? Not just to condemn them. John 3 tells us that he didn't come just to condemn the world, but he came to save us, right? And not to condemn them, not to just throw stones at them, but for them to point out you need a savior. You have a sin problem. I'm come to give you peace with God and reconcile you, and I'm here to help you. So I'm against you, but for you. And Jesus recognizes in this text that he is on a head-on collision with the thinking of the world, that people always aren't going to like him or get along with him. And furthermore, he's indicating to his brothers that you don't believe on me, and this is not the case for you. Because of your unbelief, because you are not necessarily on my team, this is not going to be the case for you, but it is for me. And naturally, this is the case for any follower of Jesus. And you, as a follower of Jesus, need to understand that. Why? So that you're not surprised when this happens and that there's animosity or there's hatred that's thrown your way by the world. And you also need to understand it so that you can question yourself if it never happens. Because if it never happens, one of two things are true. Number one, you're not following Jesus. Or number two, you are following Jesus, but you're you're not really doing it the way that you're supposed to. Inevitably, you will come head to head you will have some, some hatred or animosity that comes your way if you follow Jesus and uphold his teaching. It's a natural thing. Matthew 5 tells us this. And I love, I love the, the tension and the balance that is here in this text. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So yes, we should make peace. But blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is it, pastor? Do we make peace or are we persecuted for righteousness? Like, which one? It's both. When you make peace as the Prince of Peace did, when you try to, to lovingly guide and help and show people that you need the good news of Jesus and, and you need to be saved and there's a problem with your sin, and when you do that out of an effort to help them have peace with God, that won't always go well and naturally you will be persecuted for righteousness sake because you've done that. Make peace like the Prince of Peace and you'll, and you'll get nails, thorns, persecution, spear in your side like, like the Prince of Peace did. It's bound to happen. That's, that's, not, that's not necessarily fun to talk about. That's not something that we particularly enjoy. But it is something that you have to know is real that will come. Now, I'm not telling you go be angry and hateful and, and, and try to be, have a martyr complex and get people to hate you all the time. That's not at all what I'm saying because the scriptures tell us that our speech should be tasteful, it should be seasoned with salt, that our speech should be gracious, but it should be clear and it should be right and accurate and we shouldn't shy away from 
holding up the truth of the Word of God and holding up the true claims of Christianity. So there's a remarkable balance here. There's this balance between I'm going to stand for right and this is going to bring opposition, but at the same time I'm going to do it with the right spirit and the right attitude. Here's an illustration of this. You say, Pastor, I don't like that. Why does it have to be? Can't we all just get along and everything just be amicable? And naturally, no. Here's why. This is not my illustration. I stole it from somebody, but it works well. Joe and Jane walk into a room. Joe sees 25 people. Jane sees the same 25 people that Joe sees, but she also sees an additional 75 people that Joe does not see. What is going to happen as Joe and Jane go through that room and they mingle and they, and they have some fun? Joe is naturally going to step on things that Jane thinks are there. He's going to trample people. He's going to walk all over stuff that, that Jane sees. Jane is going to talk to spaces that Joe thinks there's nothing there and she's talking to herself. Jane will think that Joe is blind. Joe will think that Jane is crazy. This is the Christian in the world. Naturally, when you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and you understand my sin, my need for a Savior, I, I come to faith in Him. You understand there's a Creator. You understand that this world is not all there is. You understand there's eternity, that I'm, I'm playing the long game here, that this life is, is short, it's a vapor, it's done, but there's eternity. That what I do today will matter five billion years from now, and then I will be, I will be real and live and conscious, and I will remember that, and that what, what I give now will actually matter, then what I do now will matter, then what I say now will matter, then when you, when you start to absorb the Bible, you start to let the truth of the Word of God sit in your heart, you start to follow Jesus and understand His teaching, you're going to see things differently. You're going to see things that your neighbors or your unsafe family or your coworkers they don't see and you'll think they're blind. And you'll want them not to be spiritually blind. You'll want to show them the truth. You'll want to give them light. You'll want to, as John Newton wrote in that song, you know, that, that you'll want their, their chains to be gone. You'll want their heart to be set free. You'll want their eyes to be opened up. And they will think you're crazy sometimes. You, a, a, a tithe, a tithe? You give 10% of your income just because you just give it? Like there's no, what benefit do you get? At? Actually, the benefit is I'm a member of the church and I get to serve and I get to love people and I get to not be in it for myself, but be in it for other people. So you give so that you don't get, but you actually then keep on giving it. That will make no sense. It won't register. It won't register. You'll go through life with those that don't know Jesus, wanting them to see what you see, wanting them to know what you know, but they won't see it all the time unless they come to faith in Christ and they'll think you're crazy and tension will come. Naturally, it will come. So this text is not giving you the green light to go and to, and to be obnoxious to people. If you're constantly at friction with the world around you, you're obnoxious and you have a problem. If you're never at friction with the world around you, you're cowardly and you have a problem. There's a, there is a natural tension here that you have to manage, but you have to know you stand for truth and it, and it happened with Jesus and it will happen with his followers. I love what John Newton wrote actually in a, in a different song. We talked about amazing grace, but he wrote glorious things of the air spoken. Um, many of you may have sung this growing up in church, but the last stanza of that song said that fading is the world's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show, that the world's what they brag on, the show, what, what they're into, that fades, but solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's members know. Those that know Jesus know what it's like to have true joy. Those that know Jesus know what it's like to have, to have real treasure. And, and the world doesn't always get that. There's a tension that will always be there. It's unpleasant, but it's revealing that they hated Jesus. He was against the world, but at the same time, he was for the world. And if you're for the world, if you, if you understand that people have a soul, that it's not just you're made from dust to dust, the end, that, that's all. But you have a soul that's going to live on eternally forever. This will cause you to think different. This will cause you to teach them different. This will cause you to want something different for them. And at times it will collide with what's fashionable, what's in vogue, what's trendy, what the current thinking is in the culture, in every culture, not just ours, but every culture. So I'll say this and I'll move on. This does not mean that you naturally want to be opposed to things that are, that are not anti-Bible. There are plenty of things that are cultural that are just stuff. 
If everyone decides culturally that they should drive blue cars tomorrow, driving a blue car doesn't become suddenly wrong because the culture wants to drive blue cars, right? 10 years ago, brown scale was how businesses and places painted everything in brown scale. Walk into a new place that's made today, it's gray scale. Brown scale, gray scale, is one more wrong than the other? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but there are plenty of things that come into play that, that the world thinks in, in the way that they operate that is opposed to the Word of God and is opposed to the truth claims of Christianity that those have to be rejected, confronted lovingly. Those have to be, you have to be willing to stand and say, that's not okay. If, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, come tonight, because tonight I will give you three or four different times on where Psalm 42 will diverge from what the current modern American thinking is, that even the modern Christian thinking many times is, and, and I'll try to press this out a little bit, but the point is that you don't just oppose everything the world does just for the fun of it. You oppose what's anti-scripture, and you do that with a heart of love, wanting to be for them and restore them and see them be reconciled to God, but you have to know it's going to bring tension. Peacemaker, yes, but persecuted for righteousness, righteousness sake, yes, both at the same time. Secondly, I will, I will say this on this point. If your, own, if your own family rejects you, take heart. Jesus knows what that's like. Okay, if, if some of you know what it's like to come to faith and your family thinks you're crazy now, Jesus, he can sympathize with you. He knows what it's like to have family that rejects him, that doesn't believe on him, that calls him crazy, that walks away. And I encourage you to run to him and to find comfort and help from him if that's the case. Moving on, look at verse number 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up into the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So they go ahead, Jesus waits a while, presumably about two or three days. And then he goes up, but not with pomp and circumstance. He goes up in secret. Verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So they know if there's going to be a big reveal and, and there's some guy that has notoriety, Jesus is trending. This is the place where he's going to come. He's going to teach. He's going to get a following. So they're looking for him. Where is, where is he? Where is Jesus in Jesus? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. So you have people that are scared to talk about Jesus around the religious leaders because they know that there's a lot of animosity. They know that the tensions are high. So they're, they're kind of whispering to each other. Some people think Jesus is great. Some people think Jesus is not great. But there's all this murmuring setting the stage for Jesus secretly in the shadows coming into Jerusalem and what he's about to do. Verse 14. Now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So middle of the feast is about a week long. So about three and a half days in, Jesus comes to the public place, the temple, where everyone would be, and he's going to stand up. He, he kind of came in the back door, but now he's front and center on the stage there to teach. And it says this, the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? That's a funny way to say this guy knows theology, but he never went to school. What happened, right? What they're saying is he stands up to teach. My man he knows what he's talking about, but like, did, was he in that rabbinical school? Did he get a diploma from there? Where did he go? I, he never went to school. How does he know this stuff? How does, he, how does he do this so well? Jesus is kind of more or less going to say like, you know, I don't know theology. I am theology. Like there's, he kind of has an advantage as he teaches the word of God because he wrote it. But here's, here's what he's going to say. Verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine's not mine. It says that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true in no unrighteousness is in him. There's a lot contained in this, but the, to put it simply, I would say this, you need to arrest the glory thief. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm here to do the will of the Father. I'm saying what the Father wants me to say. I'm doing what he wants me to do. I'm on his timeline. I'm not self-serving in this. I'm promoting the glory of God. And he furthermore says, if you are doing the will of the Father, then you're going to get this. You're going to 
not have a hidden agenda, agenda or not have an ulterior motive. You're not going to seek your own glory. You're not going to be in this for yourself. You, you will have words and actions that reflect the will and the heart of God and the word of God and how I'm operating. You will get because we'll be on the same team, both seeking to do the will of the Father, and we'll be in step and in unison with each other. But he's pointing out a fatal flaw in these people, especially in verse 18, when he says that if you speak of yourself, you seek your own glory, but he that seeketh the glory, that, the glory of him that sent him, the same is true, no unrighteousness is in him. He's contrasting. You're in it for yourself and your own glory, or you're in it for God, for the Father, and for His glory, one or the other. And he's saying, I have the right motives, I have the right agenda, I am handling this the right way, but you don't. And this is a, this is a war, frankly, that goes on in all of our hearts. Who gets the glory, God or me? Who gets the credit, God or me? We oftentimes don't put it in these terms, but we, there's glory to be had, we just want to steal it for ourselves many times. Sometimes we even want to shove 90% of it over to God, but we want to keep 10% back for ourselves. If, if you're not careful, especially as you do good things, especially as you stand up on Sunday morning and preach, sing in the choir, go greet people, serve, sign up for VBS and go. Even in doing those good things, many times you'll find that you'll have some credit or someone, hey, man, that was an awesome song. Hey, I appreciated the sermon. Hey, thank you for always being so friendly. All these things will come out and there's a choice of does God get glory or do I get glory? Do I absorb this for, to, for myself, to myself, or do I deflect this to him? Because we know biblically that all of the glory belongs solely to God it's just a question of, am I going to rob some of it and be a thief with, with this? Because if we're honest, we, you know, I know, that there are, there are perverse, crooked little desires that slither their way into your heart that all the time, I, I want to be liked. I want to be well thought of. I want to be popular. I don't want to step on people's toes. I know all of these things that we're, what, what are we doing? We're wrestling with, am I going to do what's right and just God gets the glory and, and sometimes people won't even like me for it? Am I just going to operate that way or am I going to operate out of a way that's self-serving? Out of a way where my motives are designed to, to, to serve me and to produce something for me. Paul touches on this in 1 Corinthians 8 where he says there's knowledge-based teachers and there's love-based teachers. There's the knowledge-based teachers that want to puff up themselves and others. Look at how much we know and look how awesome we are, self-aggrandizing. Or there's the love-based teachers that are trying to build people up, that are trying to help them and edify them and work on them, that are promoting the glory of God. And, and there's one or the other. You can, you can do good things, but oftentimes with the wrong motives, and that's not okay. I, I say you, I can do that. I would be lying to you if I said every time I've ever stood up behind this pulpit to preach to you, I've done it with entirely pure motives and there was no pride of life in me and I, I wasn't concerned about what people thought and I didn't, th that would be a lie. I wrestle with that all the time, all the time, but the wrestling should take place and it should produce in us a desire and a heart to want to say, God, you get the glory, I don't. So I would, I would challenge you to examine your own heart and your own life. Why do you do what you do? Is it for the right reason? Because you'll find if you're serving yourself and for your own glory, that will fall flat and you'll inevitably get tired of what you're doing and it won't work. But if you're doing it for the glory of God, it will actually be a catalyst and a motivator and something that's good to push you forward over and over and over. And so examine yourself. I would also say pray for me. I, like I said, I wrestle with this all of the time. As soon as I became a pastor, the pride of life and wrestling with the pride of life just whoop, went through the roof in, in my own heart and mind and life. And it's something that I even need to, to remind myself of often, of what is the goal of this teaching? Is it to build people up or to look good? What, what is, what's the point here? Is it, are you trying to be a glory thief? So don't. Give the glory to God if you know him. Let's keep reading because he wasn't done. More or less, Jesus is going to say through these verses that you need to examine yourself. He points out, you may want the glory for yourself, but he's going to point out more than that. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Now that's a shot across the bow. What Jesus is saying is, you have the law. Any of you keep the law perfectly? No. As a matter of fact, you're trying to plot my murder. 
I'm pretty sure murder was against the law. Right? He's calling them out. You, they're going to be mad at him. They're still mad at him from John chapter 5. And we'll see this in just a minute. That Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath day. And they're still mad at him about that. You broke the law. You're in trouble. You're a bad guy. Is it, you say, I broke the law and I'm a bad guy. So you get to murder me because of it? I'm pretty sure you're a bad guy. Like he's, he's really, the, it, it's heating up right now. Jesus is not shrinking back from these people. Very public. This isn't a private conversation with Nicodemus. This is public in the middle of the feast. People are not going to like this very much. But he steps up and says that. Then he goes on and he says, the people answered and said, thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill me. They play all coy. Who's, who's trying to kill you? No, who's saying anything about murder, killing you? No, you're crazy. You have a devil, right? This, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Verse 20, 21. Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work and you all marvel. Referencing back to John chapter 5 when he healed that man. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye in the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I've made a man ever went whole on the Sabbath day? Now I must admit, when I was, I've read John many times in my life, but you oftentimes forget where the conversation is headed. I, I chuckled a little bit as I read this uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago or something as I'm going through this, that it, it just caught me by surprise. I'm reading the conversation. I'm like, wait, wait, circumcision? Where is this going? I don't understand what just happened in this conversation. But if you understand what Jesus is talking about, it makes perfect sense. He's telling them, you're mad at me because I healed a guy on the Sabbath day. But you have a law of circumcision that when a baby's born, eight days later, you circumcise the baby. And sometimes the eighth day falls on the, what day? The Sabbath day, Right? So do you wait till Sunday and just do it on the ninth day? Or do you do it on the Sabbath day on the eighth day? Which one is it? He says, what? It's the Sabbath day. So you're mad at me because I healed a guy, but you can circumcise your children on the Sabbath day. He's pointing out there, there's some inconsistency here with you wanting to judge me for this. You wanting to be mad at me and even plot my murder, yet... You can, you can go do this. You can circumcise a kid, but I can't heal a man. You see, you see the, the tension here? The irony is that you are now wanting to kill me for doing something that actually you kind of do the same thing. And he's telling them more or less, you got one finger pointing at me and three fingers pointing back at you, right? Judge yourself. Look in the mirror. How, how, you, you, want, you want to say I'm wrong. You want to murder me. Look at what you're doing. Why don't you take a, a look in the mirror and and find out who you really are. So here are these people that are very religious, very pharisaical, religious leaders. And Jesus says to them, you can't see your own problems. You had a massive problem. You're going to murder me. You can't see that. You're accusing an innocent one of having a devil. And beyond that, your mindset is basically, I judge you, you don't judge me, and I don't judge me. That's what he's pointing out. Your mindset is, I judge you, you don't judge me, and I don't judge me. Which, let's just be real for a minute. The longer you've grown up in church, the more prone you are to have that mindset. I judge you, you don't judge me, and I don't judge me. We are all very, very good at measuring up everyone except ourselves. Yours truly included, right? I'm spending days working on this, prepping this, working on the sermon. Yeah, all those judgy people, right? <laughs> and meanwhile, it hits me like a ton of bricks around Thursday. You're an idiot. You, you need to have a time of repentance. You need, to, you need to have some come to Jesus moments here. And you need to look at yourself. And I'm telling other people to look in the mirror, right? Not even doing it myself. So th this, is, this is so easy to do. It's, it's such a pitfall that you can fall into. That I, that I measure everyone up and I give judgment and I, and I look at them. Meanwhile, I can't do it to myself. And we know this is wrong biblically. We know we're told that if we measure ourselves by ourselves or we compare ourselves to one another, that we're not wise. What we're supposed to do is compare ourselves and judge ourselves according to the righteousness of God, according to his holiness, and see that none of us measure up. Let me see if I can illustrate. I'm, I hardly ever have volunteers in a sermon, but we need volunteers today. Who, I want to volunteer if you are under five foot two and if you're over five foot two and you're willing to say nothing 
All you have to do is stand right here. Under five foot two. Lil Dom, come on, Lil Dom, you got it. And over five foot or six foot two, we have any takers? Levi, come on, Levi. All right, here we go. We are going to compare and contrast ourselves to each other. So we have Dom. Dom, do you know how tall you are? No, not exactly. Tall enough. You're probably, you're big for your age, for sure. You're probably, we'll call you four and a half. Okay, Levi, how tall are you? Six one, six two. Six one, six two, right in the range, okay. Who's bigger? Him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Does it, you compare these two, does Levi look considerably bigger than Dom? He does. We compare ourselves amongst ourselves. Man, there, there's, a, there's a big discrepancy here. Now, if I were to take Levi and Dom and stand them in front of the U.S. Steel Building and say back up to where you can see the height of the U.S. Steel Building and see the height of Dom and see the height of Levi, how big is the discrepancy at that point? Now, the discrepancy is actually the same, but the perspective on that discrepancy is vastly different, right? All of a sudden, this, whatever, two feet doesn't really amount to much compared to the U.S. Steel Tower. Thank you, you've helped me illustrate my point. When you compare yourselves amongst yourselves, it's very easy to get Dom to Levi, wow, there's a big difference. Look at me, I'm awesome, they're not. Look at, very easy to play that game. Compare yourself to the holiness of God. Compare yourself to the law of God, which teaches you about his holy nature and about your sinful nature. Compare yourself to that, and all of a sudden you find what Romans says, we all fall short. We all flunk the good test. And all of a sudden, you know what? There's not that much difference between me and them. We are both massively in need of the grace of God and massively in need of a Savior. So what do I have to point out at them and judge them and point out their little foibles and their failures and what they did wrong? Look at all of the grace and all the forgiveness that I've received. And look how, fall, how far I fall short. Got, you are still tower to me. That's, it's massive. All of a sudden, you don't judge other people as much because you understand who you should be judging first, yourself. Romans 14, I don't have time to go there. I encourage you to read verses 7 through 12 on your own. We've mentioned this a couple times on Sunday night in the last six months. That's a very clear passage of Scripture where you're told, who's the judge? Did you make people? Did, are you the Lord of people? Are, are you the one that raises them to life? Do you sit on the judgment seat of Christ? No, it's Christ's judgment seat. And the point of that text, 7 to 12, is to say, you don't judge other people. That's not your job. We're all servants. We're all creatures. We're all made. That's God's job, and we allow him to do that, and we take ourselves off of the judgment seat, we hand him the gavel, well, we never had in the first place, but we hand our imaginary gavel we think we had over to him, and we say, this is yours, you get to be the judge, not mine. And then it moves into, so every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's, he's the one that has it all. We've said it this way, not my circus, not my monkeys, right? What are they doing? You know what? Not my circus, not my monkeys. It's not my job to judge them. This, this, this is God. He's, he's the one that gets to be the judge. So what do you do? You judge yourself. You look at yourself. You examine yourself. You see, you see your, own, your own problems and the own deceitfulness of your heart over and over again. And you go to God and you ask him for his grace and his help and his repentance. Verse 24, last verse. Before we read it, I do have to ask a question. How many of you, raise of hands, are rule followers by nature? Okay, there's a lot of you. Okay. You get to hate me today, okay? I give you permission. I give you permission. You're not going to like me. You're, you're, not, you're not even going to buy what I have to say, although I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some Bible to you about it. You're not going to like it. If, you've, if this has never been introduced to you, you're going to ride home with your spouse and say, I don't, I don't know that I buy that. that seems, it seems it could be dangerous. It could be, you're, you're just, this is not going to sit well with you. I warned you in advance. So, Understand, now, those that aren't rule followers, you have your own issues, right? Okay, 
Rule follower tend to be Pharisees. Non-rule follower tend to be prodigal, okay? So there's, there's dangers on both sides, but I'm not hitting the prodigal today. Jesus isn't hitting the prodigal today. We're hitting the rule followers today, and I'm not even gonna balance the tension that much for you. You're gonna want me to, but I'm not even going to. I'm just gonna let it set and let it fester and then tell myself that they hate me because I stand for Jesus and have a <laughs> martyr complex. All right, here we go. Verse 24, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What does that mean? That seems strange, right? Now, admit, I will admit, there is a decent amount of debate as to what this verse means. I personally think the context clearly tells it. This is all in line with this conversation. The law of Moses, look at what you're doing. What is Jesus saying? He's more or less saying, you have taken the your judgment, the appearance, the face value of the Sabbath. The law of the Sabbath is don't work on the Sabbath, right? This is pretty plain, face value. Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath and they confronted him about it. And Jesus said, you know what? You're right. I did. Truth, I did, but I'm God. The same rules that apply to him apply to me. That rule doesn't apply to me, right? So they, they've taken the face value of the law and this has led them to say, you know what? Jesus, t -t -t shame on you. Shouldn't heal a guy. In this text, he's actually trying to say, well, actually, shame on you too. Like there's some inconsistency here. It's not just that I get to work, but you know, really, should, should you have done this? But they say, here's the rule. Shouldn't have done it. They confront him. Actually, yes, I can. Further infuriates them. That's heretical. So now because you're taking the appearance and the face value of the Sabbath day, you're going to murder me. Those two shouldn't go together, right? I take the law of God at face value. That leads me to murder God. That seems like a disconnect. He says, so here's the problem. Judging according to appearance or the face value, you could even say the letter of the law. Rather, what you should do is judge righteous judgment. It shouldn't take a genius to step back and say, I healed a guy and you want to kill me. But just let that register. I healed him, you want to kill me. And you think you're following the law, every jot and tittle and nook and cranny and the face value, but this has led you to something that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. That's not righteous judgment. I get killed because I healed a dude. So Jesus is pointing out to them something that he points out often that rule followers don't really like very much. And that is that the spirit of the law trumps the letter of the law. So here's what I mean. There's a danger in being a rule follower twofold. Number one, you could put the innocent person on the hook when they don't need to be. Number two, you could take the guilty person off the hook when they need to be on it. In this text, Jesus is illustrating that you are going to put me on the hook for something that I should not be on the hook for because you're wanting to, to follow the letter of the law. In many other places, Jesus will illustrate that you're letting yourself off of the hook by following the letter of the law. So for example, you've said thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you if you lust in your heart after her, you've committed adultery. What's Jesus saying? You've said letter of the law, don't commit adultery. I didn't sleep with anyone else. I'm good. I'm telling you, don't let yourself off the hook so easy. The real intention of that was not just to say don't sleep with it. You're lusting after them. There's a problem there and you've let yourself off the hook because you're following the letter of the law, right? He does the same thing uh, all through the Sermon on the Mount. That you, you say, you know, you've heard of old time, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the judgment. That you, you slander somebody, you miss the point. You miss the spirit and the heart of the law. The point was not just don't go murder people. The point was that people were made in the image of God and you have to value their life supremely and you can't do anything to denigrate their life. You can't do anything to harm them, including slandering them, that, that you're saying I didn't murder people, I'm good. You're not good, you're guilty, right? If you're a parent, you get this. You tell your kid, eat your vegetables. No, I'm not gonna eat my vegetables, whatever. Or they just sit there and stare at it. Eat your vegetables or your whatever the punishment is. So they pick up their little fork and they start to, with their attitude, chomp at you, smack at you and let you know, I'm gonna eat my vegetables, but I'm gonna do this as defiantly as possible. I'll do what you say. I'm gonna do it with an attitude. So if you're a good parent, you'll correct that. You're gonna eat your vegetables and you're gonna do it with a good attitude. True obedience is with a good attitude. So what do they do then? <laughs> Spite you, right? 
Oh yeah, I'll do a good attitude. What are they doing? They're following the letter of the law, but they're not following the spirit of the law and you know it, right? So are they, are they guiltless and you get off the hook and good job, way to go, you're the best kid ever. No, right? This happens both ways that you put people on the hook that shouldn't be, you take people off the hook, or you, you take yourself off the hook when you should not be. I'll illustrate this personally and biblically, and I'll have to be done. I should have been done five minutes ago, but that's okay. Forgive me, I'm growing. Personally, I'll give you a couple examples. Rule followers, you're gonna hate me. We have, uh, we're church, right? We're in a, we have an academy here. As such, there are people that actually are employed by our ministry and they draw a paycheck from us. And with that comes certain expectations and obligations. Uh, some of those expectations, that there's certain events and, and church services, things like that, that they are not just, hey, you, have to, you should come to church because you love Jesus, but you're actually an employee here, we expect you to. It's mandated, right? One of our employees who gave me permission to share this and had no problem with this. Many of you would know them. They're here in the room this morning. Has a wife who has cancer and is going through a cancer struggle. Do I tell them, you know what? The law is the law. The rule is the rule. Everyone else is showing up. She's at home going through chemo treatment, probably puking her guts out, whatever's happening. Be here. The rule is the rule. Everyone else is here. Or... Am I sensible enough to say, you know what? I know the letter of the law that we made, but I understand that would not be righteous judgment and you need to be home with your wife. Which is it? Now, ultimately, that's my call, right? I don't have a, a Bible verse for that to say that here in this exactly circumstance, this is what you must do. But I would say more or less what Jesus is saying here is, ah, you got the face value, but you missed the, you missed the heart. You get this with your own children. My children, we go to bed about 8, 830 Wednesday night church, we don't even get done with group and stuff like that till 8.15, 8.20, then we're in the lobby and we're hanging out. Before you know it, it's 10 o'clock and we're going home. And wouldn't you know it, we have a rule, no whining. Wouldn't you know it, it's 10 or 10.30 now and they're particularly more whiny than they are normally at 6. Lay the hammer down, give them the same punishment that they would have had at 6 o'clock or do you understand I drug them around. It's way past their bedtime. I mean, we're not going to not correct the whininess, but there's going to be a less severe of a punishment in this instance. I would, once again, you can do what you want to with your own kids. You're the parent, I'm not. But in our household, we're a bit considerate of that. We, we understand that sometimes righteous judgment trumps the letter of the law. Here's the point. If you, if you, do, if you have no margin for this and no, no equation for this, uh, military background maybe or, or whatever it was, this is a dictatorial household, you will, you will destroy relationships. You'll kill people. You will kill people if there's no consideration for this. You'll end up in spots where you say, you healed somebody, so you die. You'll end up in, in that sort of predicament if you don't understand what verse 24 is saying. Now, some of you think that's far too squishy. I need something more rigid. That's going to lead to anarchy and chaos, Pastor. What are you doing? I'm not, I'm, there is the pendulum. There's another side of the pendulum. I don't have time to give it to you today, so maybe later. But I'll give you a biblical example that you can read on your own time because I'm out of time. We just talked about this over, over Christmas. Genesis 38, read it for yourself. Judah and Tamar. Judah relegates Tamar to a life of, of widowhood, just puts her on the outskirts of society. And, and is she, he's not just unfair to her, he's unjust to her. He gives her no shot at life. I mean, just puts her on a dead-end road. So she takes matters in her own hands, plays the prostitute, and sleeps with her father-in-law. He does not know. He finds out that she's pregnant, and he wants to kill her. And she steps up and says, I am pregnant. I did do that. And here's the garments of the guy who did it with me. <gasps> oh, that was me. Whoops. What happens in that story? Judah says, Tamar, you're more righteous than I. He does not say that she's guiltless. He doesn't say that she's righteous. But he says, you are more righteous than I am. I see that my sin, I've looked at myself now. And my sin is so great. I judge myself that what you're doing, whatever, God will take care of that. It's not... It's, what happens in that story? Did, did Tamar, there's, there's, such, there's such a balance. Did Tamar break the law? She did. She did. Absolutely, she fornicated. 
Did the law dictate that she could and should be killed for that? Yes, it did. But was there more to consider in that story than just you broke the law of the end, hammer? Yes, there was. Yes, there was. So what do we do with this? Pastor, what are you telling me to do? Okay, first, are you telling me that this is subjective? Are you telling me ab abortion's okay in certain circumstances? Are you telling me that, you know, yeah, God says that, and that's a, that's a good yeah, kind of guideline, but do whatever we want. No, this is God's law, and as such, you don't get to change it. Now, Jesus can because he was God, but you can't. Once again, you get this if you're a parent. Your kid tells you, that's not fair. You can't do that. No, it's my rule. I made the rule. I know it's fair. I get to do whatever I want. So God gets to do whatever, whatever he wants, and you get to leave it to him. So there are times where Tamar gets off the hook. There are other times where the Ark of the Covenant falls, and he tries to catch it, and he gets struck dead. I'm not God. You have to ask him. He, get, he gets to determine that. So you don't change God's law, but you do have, you do have governmentally and personally. Governmentally, I would argue and contend that we want we want to continue to perpetuate or improve upon systems where we can allow judges to judge righteously. I personally am a fan of when there's, you did wrong, you could get a fine or you could get 10 years in prison, anywhere in between, and you allow the judge some leeway to be able to make a righteous judgment. Do they always do that? No, they don't. But a system that allows that seems to be in line with what the people would have. But personally is where it falls to you. Personally, be very, very careful not to fall into the trap of here's the face value, here's the law that you made for yourself, right? You made your own family rules, you made your own rules for your kids, you made that stuff for yourself, and now you're subservient to your own rules where it puts you in a situation that's completely nonsensical, where you're actually not judging righteously because of the rule that you set up. I gave you an example of us with an employee. We continue to have a rule that we expect you to be at these events. But in this particular instance, no. Why? Because we understand there's more to it than just the rule. Hopefully that makes sense and hopefully you can strike a good balance. Because Jesus is pointing out that these people, these people struggled big time and they really never got there. They end up murdering him. To judge themselves and to be able to step back and see that there's, there's massive inconsistencies here to say, heal somebody, kill you. That that does not work out. And he's trying to help them see that, that you need to consider more than this and not just, you need to sometimes have the spirit of the law more than the letter of the law. So for you, know that the world's going to oppose you. If it doesn't, ask yourself why, okay? Know that you're supposed to give God the glory and not take it for yourself. Know that you need to judge yourself and not other people. And know that sometimes the spirit of the law has to trump the letter or else you're going to put people on the hook that shouldn't be and you're going to take yourself off the hook when you should be.